Welcome to the Visual Content Marketing Show. I'm your host Krishna Day and this week we're going to be looking at Google Hangouts to promote crisis management and our guest is Rich Klein. So I'm thrilled that he's able to be with us here today. So back to me just for a moment. Um, great to be back here with everybody. Thank you for those of you who participated last week. We'll be talking to Rich in just a couple of minutes. But I want to just go through a couple of things before we get right into the show as this is just our second episode. In this series called the Visual Content Marketing Show, we're going to be talking about lots of technologies, tools, trends, and practical tips in terms of that you can use in your organization. What I decided to do in the first part of the show, because it's really on topic at the minute, is actually for the first several episodes, is look at the topic of Google Hangouts. So I, if you didn't catch last week's episode, um, then you can go to visualcontentmarketingshow.com. You'll be able to access it there. And also, you'll be able to get replays, providing that Google is playing nice with us today. You'll get a replay of this as well. So don't worry if ever you can't join us. In terms of our guest today, he's been using Google Hangouts for 18 months or so. And therefore, for me, he definitely is a Hangout pioneer. And that's what I've termed this little mini-series. So if you decide that you want to um, use um, Twitter or post into Google Plus or Facebook, anywhere you might be, even on, on um, Instagram, then I'll be checking out the hashtag a little later. We're using the hashtag um, uh, Hangout Pioneers. So I know that um, our guests, or my guests I should say, really don't uh, want to be saying, oh yes, we're kind of at the bleeding edge of this, but for my mind, they all have been. So I hope you're going to enjoy the shows. So as I said, in this mini-series during January and February, we're going to be looking at that. I also want to say thank you, though, and I'm just going to go back to a screen share for a moment to actually um, pick up some people who were very kind and actually said thank you to us um, last time for being uh, on terms of in the show. Um, and I just want to highlight here John Torsney, who's in Ireland, and he tweeted out and also shared on Google+. Plus that he enjoyed the show last week, so thank you, John. Uh, excellent insights um, in terms of how to conduct Google Hangouts. Um, and I also was delighted that Eileen Brody at Digidesk, so you can actually find her on Google+, Plus, Eileen Brody Digidesk, she actually said, thanks for inspiring me to consider a weekly learn and play show for my talk techie business tools and Hangout Google Plus community members. So she has a Google Plus community um, where they're talking about all, all about technical technology and tools. So do find that in terms of connecting with Irene over on Google Plus. But that's exactly what I'm talking about. One of the things that I find is that very often people um, come along to a show, but I'm really interested in seeing how can this inspire you to take action. So just back to a, a couple of sli slides we went back before. Remember, you can go to visualcontentmarketingshow.com. Uh, there's a little video there. If you decide that you want to get email updates about new shows that are going on, uh, in fact, you can also go there to watch previous episodes. Um, just go to Visual Content Marketing Show and put in your details there. And uh, make sure that you leave us your feedback and questions for us in terms of using the hashtag in terms of uh, Hangout Pioneers. So I'm delighted, Rich, that you're able to join us. Let's head over to to actually feature you now. You're nice and, and uh, focused there in terms of on the screen for everybody to see. Um, Rich, you and I have known each other probably since 2006. And in those days, we connected through um, teleseminars. Um, you were a guest on one of my early podcasts. Um, all around uh, communications and we didn't focus so much on crisis communications in that particular show if I remember rightly but I know that's your speciality and media relations and I was super impressed um, in terms of talking to you um, about the fact that that many you know months ago 18 months ago more I think it is now that you decided to jump into Google Hangouts. So you do have a badge. If I had a badge here, I'd give it to you. As for me, you're a Hangout pioneer. But why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about your business and specifically in terms of 
what gave you the idea to jump into this platform when frankly there was hardly anybody else using it? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Krishna. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, for those of you out there, Krishna uh, has been a, uh, a frequent guest of mine on The Crisis Show, and she'll be joining us, uh, if I can do a shameless plug here, uh, at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow night. Uh, we're having an all-star panel, and Krishna, you are an all-star in your, in your field of social media marketing and re online reputation. So uh, we, uh, we like to help each other, and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure, uh, you know, Growing with you in this world of, of online communications, uh, really since 2006, uh, I, I recall uh, our first podcast, uh, the interview you did with me, which was a big deal, and then we uh, went to Blog Talk Radio, which at the time was the big thing, and uh, really since Google Hangouts on Air was introduced, and it was introduced in May 2013, um, and at the time, um, I've always been a, sort of a techie. 2012, I think, isn't it? 2012, yeah. thank you, 2012, yeah. 18 months. Because you've been there more than 18 months. That's right. To May of 2012, I, I saw that it was being introduced, and I said, you know what, i got to learn this stuff. And I really saw it as an opportunity, uh, not so much as a moneymaker, but more to market my business and to educate people. It's really become an educational tool for those uh, people in business and government and nonprofits uh, to learn about how to navigate all kinds of crisis situations. And so we started out... And uh, much like your guest said last week, uh, there are glitches, partly because of Google, partly because there's no uh, how-to manual, if you will, when, when you start out using this stuff. You really have to learn as you go along, as we are continuing, continually doing, because Google keeps uh, moving the goal line, if you will, in terms of how to use the program. But it is a powerful tool, and uh, I think what you're doing, Krishna, is wonderful, because it's teaching people how to use it in a wide variety of ways, and uh, it's, it's just amazing the applications uh, that you can use. So I started using it because I wanted people to know about what crisis management is. I wanted them to learn how to communicate with the media and their critical audiences. And so the show started out, uh, I have to just give a plug to uh, two people in, in that world, Jonathan Bernstein, Bernstein Crisis Management California, and Melissa Agnes uh, out of Montreal, Canada. They were my original co-hosts. Um, and so when I came to them with the idea, uh, they bought into it. We built up a website pretty quickly. Uh, Melissa's uh, husband happened to be an excellent web designer. We, we use the WordPress platform. And we just, you know, we spent about probably not more than a month preparing for it and just, you know, Went, went live. I think the first show we lost the signal uh, and had to do it in two parts and that has happened on occasion um, because what we try to do on the show is not just be a bunch of talking heads. What I try to do is introduce uh, other videos. So if we're analyzing for instance the high profile crisis situations of that week or that month, uh, whether it was a natural disaster or a branding issue, um, I would try to bring in video, so actually play the video just like you would see on the news. I really saw this originally uh, sort of as a newscast with some analysis. Uh, one of the challenges I've had with that and continue to have with that is because of copyright issues, I was very often cut off from doing that. And so we had to do this dance with trying to uh, read the news or play a video that wasn't copyright protected to get the message across. Because it's always better to show something rather than just talking about it, I felt. So very often we would do a screen share of a breaking news story or a press conference. And then uh, somebody would talk, we'd introduce the press conference, for example, analyze how a government official, for example, would deliver his or her messages and then talk about what they could have done better. And that's been uh, a big part of the show, for sure. Then I think what's really been a pleasure to watch over the last 18 months of having the show is that we've expanded from the United States around the world. The show is now seen in about 113 countries at least once. Uh, we're trying to build our viewership beyond, beyond that in the coming year and certainly reach a, a more of a global audience, hit some other continents, hit some other countries. But the really nice thing is we all learn from each other. So I have, like just for example, yourself tomorrow from Ireland, people from, from uh, Australia, from the States and around Europe. It's a nice global audience, and we all have something to add to this education. 
Um, I'd love to come back to the topic of copyright in a little while, but let's go back to those early days, if you can even remember it. And one of the things I'd really like to explore with you is because people get concerned around starting their first show. It doesn't matter whether it's a podcast, it's a webinar, but even more so if it's something like this where it's live streamed. What were your concerns that you had, if any, around that first show? And um, what, did you, what were your experiences? You know, you've already said that you took a month to prepare for the first event. Yeah. Well, when I say prepare, that included getting a website up, a social media channel set up so we could promote it and so forth. Um, I think, well, let me just back up, and I'll let's say it this way. We started out, when I started the show, we would have like five or six, sometimes seven or eight topics and try to do a run-through of the top crisis events. And it, that the show went that way for probably, I would say, the first seven or eight months. Um, and that was okay. And then I decided, you know what, this show might work better if we narrow this down to one or two topics each week. And now what we basically do is we focus on one topic, with the exception of a special show like tomorrow where we're doing a look back to the past year and going forward. We'll cover a, a big area. But I found it much more useful, and the feedback I was getting was there's too much information. Uh, so the, the challenge in the first few shows, first of all, were technical, no question. There were a lot of bugs within Google's engines in, in, in the launch of the show. People were getting cut off uh, for all kinds of reasons, and then trying to get back on, especially the host, was really frustrating. So my co-host and my guest would be left really holding the ball, if you will, holding the bag, uh, to keep the show going. Uh, we laugh about it now, but those things still happen on occasion. They happen much less so uh, than they used to. So that, that was one challenge. The other challenge was just uh, you know echoes of audio and uh, uh, certain guests who didn't have the, the proficiency in the technology. They, had, they were very good speakers. I had seen them speak live, for instance, or watch them uh, deliver a lecture in, in a classroom, but didn't know how to use the technology. So there were times when, and this worked sometimes, where I brought people in just by phone only. We did a show once on, a, uh, each year we try to do a show in advance of the, the college semester about uh, crisis situations for higher education. Uh, and I get these great guests from around the country, rep, you know, spokespeople and participants from different universities. And um, one of the people is just really a dynamic PR person, former journalist, but really wasn't on top of the technology. So we brought him in by phone and it worked just fine. You know? So those are some of the, cha the technical, technical challenges we face. I think my also, also when we started out, I was concerned about not being able, be able to fill up the hour, uh, but that was not a problem. <laughs> As time went on, we all got more comfortable. Also, just like any other medium, uh, uh, broadcast medium, uh, we, the chemistry helps a lot too. So once you have a co-hosts the same people after a couple of weeks. You develop this rapport just like a comedy team would, uh, being able to know what their strengths and weaknesses are, and, and they for me as well. Uh, so that really helps too, having one or two people on every show that you could depend on as well, particularly if you have a brain freeze, for instance, or you can't find your notes or some, something goes wrong, that person can help, help you keep the show going. I think you're absolutely right, Rich, around the fact of how you support people coming on. I remember, and shh, don't tell anybody if they're listening, because they might know them, but the world is so small. But I remember back in 2005, my first ever podcast show that I was hosting. And in the early days, I decided who I, decided who I was going to interview. And I thought, these people will be great. And uh, particularly in terms of somebody who I thought would be good in conversation, and in fact, they were some of my worst shows. I did have bad shows after that as well, um, but it's about preparing people. Let, let's talk about what you've done to support people, because I know that's, again, one of the challenges. One thing is about being in front of camera. Another right. one is around how do I prepare my guests so you spend some time. And I know, for example, when I came onto the show the first time, and I know that I've had email notifications from you around um, what, you know, getting onto the show into the green room to prepare beforehand. What are some of the practical things? And, and give us an idea about the amount of time that you found that you need to invest, particularly for people um, as they're coaching others to join them as a guest onto the show. 
Sure. Well, well, first of all, it it it, it can be an all day event preparing for the show. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention one thing. One of my inspirations to do the show in the first place was a guy named Leo Laporte. I don't know if you know Leo Laporte, This Week in Tech. And after watching that show and uh, the as good as they are, they're also informal, so they're not too formal, not too buttoned up. I like their style, and I try to try to model my show a little bit after that. That was a, a big inspiration, This Week in Tech. And that, of course, has grown into a nice uh, company on, on, on their end. But that was a good that was a good model for me. So I try to watch that show pretty regularly. Aside from learning about technology, the way they is they started out small as well in, the, in, a, in a smaller studio uh, and having a conversation. But to get back to your question about preparation, so the day of a show, for example, like tomorrow is especially a big day because I have a lot of guests. Although when, the more guests you have, the easier your job is as a host and producer. And that's the that's the main point here that when you're it's it, you're not just the host, you're also the producer. So my job is to create the content, to, to have a dialogue with my guests about what they want to talk about. I, I try to play to their strengths each week, I do my research on my guests, particularly if there's somebody new. Uh, maybe it's a, a blog they wrote about that really resonated with me and I think would resonate with my audience. So I will focus on that blog post, for example. If there's a breaking news situation, which we try to do often, I will study that as much as I can, reading the wire services, reading the local news, the, uh, the global news, um, looking, about, looking on social media, see, see what people are saying about that event and how they came through that crisis, for example. So I'll do this holistic approach to my research, and that can take you know, three or four hours uh, before the show. And then what I try to do is, uh, if my show's at 7 p.m. Eastern time, for example, uh, I try to gather people between 6.15 and 6.30, and we have a, what I call a warm-up show. Uh, and that's, that plays, uh, that has a lot of benefits. First of all, we, for those people who uh, haven't used the technology, get them making sure their audio and vi visuals are good, and then we can hit the start broadcast button once everybody's in. But by the way, the old way was you had to get out of the, the warm-up show and then start a new one, and that would be very, and one of the glitches we had early on was we couldn't get, people back into the live show. We'd be talking for 45 minutes about all these great sound bites and ideas, and then all of a sudden we'd lose them. Uh, and then you'd be in the middle of a show, and somehow they'd get in for a minute, get out. You know, so we had those issues. The nice thing about the technology now is you can start something in the green room and then continue it, like, as you and I just did. So and the, the, the warm-up show really helps us a lot. It helps us get to know each other helps us uh, create the content kind of on the fly. Very often I'll say to a guest, oh, don't say that now, save it, this is a good debate, you know, because we get, we very often get some good opposing viewpoints, and we'll try to save that energy for the show. Uh, and then the other thing we do is we, uh, we have a chat window open, so when you have the show, uh, people can send notes to each other that only participants can see. Uh, one of the things I introduce for my guests is, if you want to be called on to say something or add a point or debate a point, you put an exclamation sign in the chat box. And so for people who've been on my show, they know that when they said exclamation point, I can say, hey, Mike, uh, you want to add something. So it comes across more naturally than a person sitting there for 20 minutes trying to get their point across, <laughs> waiting their turn. So we try to do things that make it easier to make the conversation flow. So I hope that helps a little bit answer your question. And what about the fact that some people may not even have set up a Google Plus profile who might have been guests because people are still you know, coming into the platform. I know many people have Gmail addresses, but equally not many people have actually set up a profile. What have you done to support them around that? Have, have you given them some tips about having that and then being able to come into the show? Yeah, uh, I, that's been a challenge for sure. Uh, I have spent hours getting trying to do that with some people. Uh, look, I, some of these people are really top-notch in their field. I mean, world-renowned, and I really want to get them on if I can. And so I do, do do my best to do that. I mean, some of the other issues are, it's. I mean, that that's one that you what the one that you raise is legitimate one, but very often it's something like um, you really need to be on a hardwired connection to to be effective on this show. So one of the tips I'd for your audience is. You don't want to use wireless if, if, if at all possible. You really want to have an Ethernet connection because the, the video broadband and the high-definition broadband that, that we're using today takes up a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, a broadband of, of, of Internet space. So you really need to have that strong connection. I actually use a, 
a high-speed modem beyond uh, one of the really powerful modems for my cable company, just because I had a lot of issues early on with the signal, the upload and download not being strong enough. So if you're going to host a show, make sure you get the uh, fastest, most powerful modem you can afford. I, I recommend that highly. And that also goes for your camera and your microphone as well. Uh, the best equipment you, you can find if you're hosting and producing. Not, not as much if you're a guest once in a while, but if you're going to do a show like this, you really have to try to have the best equipment. But to, to, help, you, to help people prepare, yes. Uh, as I said earlier, Google has changed the game so many times about alerting people, bringing people into the show. It's a little bit easier now than it was before to invite people in. Uh, I'll give you an example of one of the one of the uh, things we ran into. One of my guests, a guy named Felix Nader, who you'll meet tomorrow night, he's a, a world-renowned workplace violence expert. But he had two Gmail addresses, and so did another guest of mine, Gene Benz, who's a security expert. And so you would go to invite them through Google+, Plus, but you don't know which Google+, Plus account they're using. Or their name could be du du duplicated to somebody else, and you could be inviting a total stranger into your show. So it's always good uh, on the front end to make sure you have you know exactly what their account name is. In, in, in the case of Felix Nader, he had a middle initial, and that's how I differentiated him. So that's also important in preparing, because these things do happen, and believe me. I'm trying to share my mistakes with your audience so they don't make them. Uh, but, but certainly those are things. The other thing I would say is... Uh, uh, desktops are usually better than laptops, um, and uh, laptops are often better than iPads and iPhones uh, to do to do to be a guest on the show. I know that um, even before we were having the show today, you've got a couple of different profiles, and I've got a, def a couple of different profiles on Google Plus. I've got a, a business page and a personal profile, and I think your point is really well um, said there because it's like. You know, are you sending people the invitation to the right profile? It's obviously getting a little bit easier now, where we can have um, unique URLs for for yes. Google Plus profiles and pages. Um, but I know I think that happened to me at, at one one show last last year, where somebody was inviting me, but I, it was coming to the wrong place. Um, so it's, it's a really really good tip. You mentioned yeah. about technology. I know that's another question many people have, and you mentioned around um, some tips you had there about about the quality of the, the technology. Uh, but equally, I know that some people perhaps don't have that budget or are unsure to get started. And I think we all go through that process, don't we, about improving things as we go. Um, I just know from, as I said, from my early days of podcasting, you know, I then moved up in terms of the, the quality of the equipment. I've done the same in terms of video content. So hopefully my video this time this year is better than it was last time last year, or this time last year, I should say. Um, what kind of things are you using in terms of um, your tech behind the scenes there? It's really quite simple. I mean, I have a, uh, a fairly new iMac I bought about a year and a half ago. So I use the built-in camera. I've been satisfied with that. Um, what, I tr what I've tried to do is learn more about audio and lighting separately. Uh, and I've tried to study that. I'm, I'm still not there yet. I have a lot to learn uh, because even on some of my old videos, even if the content's good, I think as Sarah said last week, you know, there, you don't want to look dark on the screen. You know, she referred to that. Uh, she actually gave a good tip about the lighting. So you want to have as much light as you can, um, you know, on your face uh, and on your, on your back. I, I prefer, and this is really a personal thing, I prefer a clean background. I do typically have a Crisis Show logo. I, I'm making a new one right now, that's so why I don't see it. But I, I just like that look of uh, just not having distractions. I've had guests where you know they got the cat coming down the stairs, they got a a painting in the background behind their head, a plant coming out of their head. Um, I just think my advice to people is to keep it simple and clean as possible uh, is always best because you you know you want the viewers to focus on you and what you have to say, not be distracted. So that would be another tip. Um, on the audio side, um, right now I am using the. Uh, built-in audio microphone of the iMac, but I'm also in the market for a higher-end microphone. I had one that, that broke, uh, but you know, brands like Rode and Shure, there's, um, there's another one that's called, uh, I think it's called Yeti, makes a good mic too. Uh, it's called the, I think it's called Blue something, I have to look it up, I'll get back to you on that. But these, are, these all take your game up a little bit in terms of professional quality or near professional quality, sound and video, I think that's important as well. Yeah, in fact, it's the Yeti Blue microphone Yeti that I have. Blue, thank you. Um, yes, that's what yeah. I was thinking 
Yeah. Um, so let's talk uh, uh, firstly around some ideas about promoting, but I don't want to miss the opportunity of coming back and talking about the really important topic of copyright as well. So I know from what I've seen you do of your show that you are very active in terms of promoting the show um, quite well in advance. So perhaps you can tell people about what you found have been the best ways to do that. And I, and it's very impressive that you've had people join you from all over the world. And I know that's one of your goals um, going forward in terms of having um, more guests sit on your show from uh, from international uh, markets. You know, because I know you're based in in the U.S. And tomorrow, uh, as tomorrow shows, obviously w one further step in that direction as well. So let's look at what have you done to build that global viewership firstly sure thanks for asking so um, one of the things I would say about that is uh, like you I use a lot of social media uh, really heavily dependent on it and uh, you know this is still you know as old as social media as young as social media is what are we we talking uh, 2005 or 6 was the birth of social media in my world uh, of course I, I used old programs like AOL and Prodigy back in the 80s but, but real social media, you know, early 2000s. So it's still in its infancy, right? So, but, but as these tools get more useful and, and where you can use them more together, uh, they, the benefits start to show. So I use, I have a face, like, let me back up. I have a, on Facebook, for example, I have my personal Facebook page, but I, and I also have two other Facebook pages. One is called The Crisis Show. So I will promote it on my Facebook page, also my Rich Client Crisis Management page, which is my business page. Um, so I'll, use, I'll, I'll put a link up there promoting the show. One of the things, as you know, we can all do now, which is wonderful, is being able to create a trailer for your show. And I just, like you, did my first one last week to promote my show for tomorrow night. And I'm really happy with it. I like the way it came out, and it's been useful, and people are watching it. Uh, it's just a nice way to bring people in. So I hope you were happy with the trailer I produced for you, Rich. No, it was wonderful. Thank you. No, I loved it. Uh, so thanks. So um, so I use Facebook. Uh, on, on Twitter, I use at the crisis show and at rich client crisis. Uh, sometimes I'll vary my text a little bit on each of them because on the crisis show, it's more of the show and rich client crisis is more me. Uh, so I use both of those tools as well. So Twitter and Facebook. Um, I also use LinkedIn, another powerful place to post things. And the thing about LinkedIn is beyond putting it just on your regular profile, I find it really useful to join as many groups as you can, uh, 50 and above, I think it is. I think I've gone to 50. So, for example, if I'm doing a show on uh, emergency management, as I do often with Mike McKenna of Team Solutions, I will post that in any group that's relevant to that subject. So I really try to target, uh, like, much like you do, you target your, your content to the audience that you think is going to be most interested. And so I try to do that uh, link on LinkedIn. I hit those groups depending on the topic. Um, Google Plus, of course, is the obvious one. And uh, I, I still have to, you mentioned about the different uh, uh, profiles of Google Plus. I have to admit, I have to clean up my Google Plus. I have profiles that were created a year ago there were you could create two pages on the same profile but then the business pages got better so I had duplicates so I have to change that that's one of my goals in the next few weeks is clean that stuff up because I am actually out there too much on Google Plus uh, but I do use Twitter a lot I use Facebook a lot uh, the trailers really help a lot as well and tell me then in terms of post the show is there anything else do you do including <laughs> telling people that you meet in the real world because we've talked about a lot of online for me it's about integration as Absolutely. well in terms of um, perhaps putting it on your business cards or if you're speaking at an event or you're meeting a new potential client what kind Absolutely. of things have you done with that? Yeah, well, let, me, let me first say that um, with the show uh, it's been a, a great boost to my business since I started and I, and I say that because I, I want other people to use this, this, this tool uh, as a marketing tool for their businesses, uh, it really helps a lot. I get, I get calls, and they'll say. I actually had a very interesting call about six months ago. They had seen one of my guests and really liked that person. It happened to be an attorney. It turned out they didn't have a legal problem. They had a, cri a, a crisis management media problem, and I ended up getting the business because of the show. So 
because there was a comfort level. You know, we talk about, you know, you and I have observed and been fans of people like Michael Port and Seth Godin over the years, and, and I really like what they say, which is it's all about trust and credibility. And what better way to gain that than through this video uh, medium, this, this visual medium, as you say. So that really helps a lot. And I use uh, the crisis show uh, to, to get to answer your question about what I do after the show. The first thing I do is I go into YouTube and I put in all the hashtags I need uh, and the keywords that I need uh, to plug the show po post production. Um, I'll, I'll also at the same time uh, put in annotations. So I'll put in things like to tweet about the show, use this hashtag. Uh, I'll maybe put in the name of the episode, what the topic is. Um, I will in the description on YouTube, this is a really good trick for people to, to find your website, so put in your website right on top. Uh, one of the challenges, as you know, Christian, on YouTube is they don't give you a lot of visual space to put in. You always have to hit that show more button. So I always put my uh, website, the Crisis Show website, and sometimes my own as well. Or if I'm promoting a particular guest that week, I might put in their link uh, as well and put in a very short description about the show inside YouTube and inside Google+, again, using hashtags and, and keywords uh, around the topic of the show. And that, that's helped the viewership as well. Uh, the other thing I do is uh, if you go to www.thecrisisshow.com, one of the things that uh, I've been doing since the show's inception, June 2012, is to put in show notes and links so that if we're covering a topic on the show and we can't show it, or we can't give it the treatment, the in-depth treatment we think it deserves, uh, I will post you know, further information links to that topic. And very often it may be news coverage of that event. So I might post something from the BBC or CNN or Associated Press, uh, Wall Street Journal and so forth, and uh, as well as you know, some great blogs and tweets as well. So let's go to that topic then you were mentioning around um, copyright because that really goes back to what you were mentioning on your show notes and I have to say Rich I hope people were listening and taking notes there because you gave some absolutely terrific tips you're right in terms of get your URL or even the URL of your page back on your website where you've got your hangout show because then you have that as the first link that people will see and and great ideas about how you use annotations on on YouTube to do that so thank you so much for those great tips Actually, I'd like, to add one more, I'd like to add one more important one. I haven't experimented with it that much yet, but it's something that's very new or fairly new, which is you can now embed the link to your live show anywhere on the web where well, you couldn't do that before. You used to, the, the, when this started, when this uh, technology started, you really, you had to start the broadcast and then gra try to grab the link, but I was too busy running the show to do that. But now, you, because you can set up an event, you can now grab that link and put it onto your website or put it into a blog or a tweet, and that's going to be really powerful for everybody out there. I also just want to quickly give a shout-out to a guy named Ronnie Binsa. He's the Hangout Helper, and I know Sarah is also your guest from last week, is also a big fan. He's been tremendously helpful to me. He gives away a lot of information for free, but he also has a membership. He's been, he is the expert on Google Hangouts on air. Uh, even if he wasn't a pioneer, per se, he has picked, up, picked it up. He's got a big following. But if it's Ronnie Benson on Google+, Plus, been very helpful in terms of, uh, and I hope you get him as a guest, actually. He'd be good to have. <laughs> well, he is going to be a guest. Shh, don't give away all my secrets, okay? I, but yeah, he is. <laughs> he, he, he is. I just hope you get him. <laughs> no, no, he, he is a guest on, on my show good. coming up um, in, in February, in fact. Good. And okay. um, you're right, he gives away a lot of great tips. And the other thing I often find, and I did say this to him recently, that if I'm doing a search and I'm logged into Google, and if it's even broader than Google Hangouts, if I do a search for YouTube, often he's written about it, and you know, hats off to him because of the fact that um, it takes a lot of time to write the amount and create the amount of content that he has done over the last couple of years. Um, but obviously, you know, he now comes up for all sorts of searches he might do. So lots, lots of helpful tips there around yes. that. Yeah, and and um, you said you meant you liked uh, his content as well. Love it. No, he's been very helpful. Particularly, he he's particularly helpful when Google introduces a new, you know, uh, tool that we don't really know about. You know, they'll he'll find out about it and then he'll dig into it uh, and explain it very well. He's got he's just he's a great presenter uh, on his videos and his text. He's just wonderful. So yeah. 
And I think he also has a relationship with Google, so he gets to beta test things. Scope, yeah. in advance. So yeah. back to, actually, yeah. you just gave a great tip there about embedding the content. Um, and in fact, if people looked and came across this show because of the tweets that I sent out, for example, or my Facebook post, that's exactly what I did because I set up this show as a live event. Um, and it's actually not from YouTube, but I did it from um, the Google Plus side of the of the business in terms of then going to Hangouts there. So there's lots of different ways you can have Hangouts and you can have private ones. But to um, the point that Rich was just mentioning before, that's exactly what I did. I have written a blog post, and on that blog post um, is embedded the code for this live event. So people could actually watch this now as it's streaming live, either from the event page, from my YouTube profile, or they could also watch it on my blog. And so that's really helpful right. for people who are not using Google+. Plus. Obviously, YouTube, anybody can go and look at it. They, you know, you don't have to be logged in even to, to watch that content. So therefore, ahead of the show, it was saying, five hours beforehand, you know, uh, it's, you know, an hour beforehand, and then it will start to stream live. And as soon as the show is finished, it will be there as well. So what that means is, back to your comment before, Rich, about your, um, your show notes, which I think are a really good thing to do for also, not just to help people, but in terms of navigate content, but also for search engine optimization, is you can then go back over to YouTube um, but you can also do that on your own site, and of course, then you could do it on Google+. Plus. So really, really helpful tips that you shared in terms of, of those things. And, uh, and also, as you say, um, in terms of keeping up to date with all the new things that are going on in terms of with, with Google+. Plus. Let's just come back to that point, though, around copyright. Sure. And um, the thing that you were mentioning is around some of your show notes, you embed other links. Tell us about your experience and what you need to be careful of um, in the relation to broadcasting within a broadcast because I know YouTube has got very strict copyright rules there so you were saying about you know you can't necessarily play a video within a video yeah and, and that's that's a great point and uh, to be frank uh, I was very naive when I started the show and still am to a large extent on this issue and I'm not a copyright lawyer or anything like that uh, but what I've discovered is if you play a YouTube video, even if it's a news. I mean, I, I originally thought it was just about music and movies. Uh, I didn't think there was any harm that if CNN was, in other words, I didn't think there was any harm if a website was putting up their own video and you were playing that video inside your broadcast on, on Google Hangouts on air. I didn't understand what the problem was, but apparently Google does. And a lot of times I got knocked out of my shows because of it. And so what I do now is I try to find things that are, uh, let's just say, are not on the radar of Google, Google's uh, uh, tools to detect, you know, what's copyright protected. So I try to find stuff from blogs and other places that might not, you know, might not be labeled as, you know, official copyright situations, like a, a major broadcaster. Uh, and what I've learned is. Uh, early on, early on, the first few months of doing the show, that there was no exact science to it, Christian. Sometimes they would knock me out, but a lot of times I survived and got through a show, and we ran a whole videotape of something of a press conference, um, and we didn't get penalized. But other times we did and got knocked out. And what would happen was you'd get this message, you'll, you'll get knocked out, and then it's sort of like a big slap on the wrist, saying, "Promise me you're not going to do that again, and <laughs> then we'll let you back in." And you had to hit the checkbox, and I said, "Okay, you caught me," you know, and, and you get back on. Uh, I use those videos very judiciously now because the show is advanced, so I don't have to use them as much. And because I have uh, just great guests to, to talk through some of these things, I don't use them. I'm not as dependent on them as I used to be, but I still like to use them when appropriate. Uh, so what I'll do now is maybe I'll I'll find something that's not copyright protected. Uh, that's or I get permission to use something. From someone's blog or something that's lesser lesser known, and, and still use the information. I like also one of the things I love to do on the show is even just to show a headline uh, of a local newspaper. So, for example, if there was a crisis overseas, uh, to be able to go to that local website because that, I, I, as a former journalist, I find that's going to be your best news coverage of the event. Uh, people who are up close to a situation, you got to get the best reporting, the best graphics, the best videos. 
So I tried to do that as well, and I think that helped build this global audience I'm trying to build. And you mentioned also about going to ask people um, for for permission. Have you actually approached people by email or or said I'd like to feature you in the show or talk Absolutely. about something? Absolutely. And you know, part of my research for doing the show uh, when I when I do the show is that um, you know it's very often content for the show comes from a social media post or a blog or an article, and it, it as I said earlier, it really uh, you know resonates with my audience. Uh, so if somebody, I, I'll give an example, uh, Jonathan Bernstein of Bernstein Crisis Management uh, and Eric Bernstein of No More Crisis, uh, who also works with, with uh, Jonathan, they came out with this idea called the Wiener Award that we're going to talk about tomorrow, a little plug for tomorrow. Uh, but they wrote a whole piece on it uh, and getting, they're getting some buzz going on social media. That's going to be a focus. And Jonathan actually came to me when I told him about the, the, you know, the show I was doing, planning for tomorrow. He said, I have something I want to plug on the show. So I like to do that with my guests. If, whatever they're working on, uh, I've had many of the top crisis management authors in the world come on and literally take the book off the shelf and show them because I want it to be a worthwhile endeavor for them as well to be on the show. So I, I don't mind doing that. And Usually I have read the book or read the, read the uh, outline and I like to promote their stuff equally. And what have you found has worked the best in terms of connecting with them? Um, you and I know each other, so um, I could message you and say, "Hey, Rick, uh, Rich, I'm, I've got this show coming up, and could give you an idea of what I wanted to cover." But what about people that have that actually don't know you? What have you found the best way to connect and say, "Would you like to be on on the show?" Yeah, well, typically what I'll do is I'll send them an email and I'll, I'll let them know that something they wrote or said uh, grabbed my attention. Um, and I'll really a short email to you know first let them know I know who they are that I've done my research, and also uh, send them a little bit of information about the show. I'll typically send them a link to the show, let them know again that it's seen around the world, it has been seen around the world, and that uh, it's a good audience for them. Uh, try to make it in their interest to to to, to appear on the show. Uh, that's where I start, and I, I have been so fortunate. Uh, I. I've met some wonderful people from, uh, you, may, you may recall we did a show on the, uh, the, the, the horse meat scandal in Europe that started in Europe and, and Asia, and even the guests that we had on that show, people who I never met before, we had a nice dialogue if you recall, just that was just a great show in terms of educating people about what to look out for, your, your perspective on the ground in Ireland, which was, which was excellent, and then having a, an attorney who specialized in this particular area. So we try to bring a wide variety of viewpoints, and that's what I try to do with every show. I try to get a nice mix of people with different perspectives and different expertise. I think that's what has made the show the success it has been and hopefully a big success going forward. Now, I can't have you on the show without us talking about crisis communications because I know it's something that both of us have been involved in and obviously it's you know pr the primary part of your role, it's, it's part of what I do as well. And I thought it'd be worthwhile before we just wrap up um, to actually explore a few thoughts between us about how we think Google Hangouts could be used either in terms of helping you prepare for you in risk management and crisis management planning or during a crisis or how you manage after it. So I'm going to pass the ball to you first to get started. I'm sure you've got lots of ideas and perhaps you've been encouraging people to do this or perhaps you've been using Google Hangouts with your clients as well. So that's the topic for the next couple of minutes. Okay. Well, I'm going to keep this a little brief. I know we're short on time, but let me say this. Um, <coughs> excuse me. In terms of using Google Hangouts, uh, for crisis management, it has a couple of applications that come to mind immediately. One is, one of the things I talk about all the time is there are three key timelines in a crisis, uh, before, during, and after. And I think where a lot of businesses and organizations uh, fall down on the job, if you will, is in the planning stage. Bef you know, When they get into a crisis, it's like, okay, I need to take care of this, that, and the other thing. But they don't do enough to plan for the worst. And so I try to educate people, and we do this on the show all the time, which is get people... that get people aware of the kinds of situations they could face. So Google Hangouts could be used privately, first of all, to, for media training, uh, to train people how to respond to a news conference that happens very fast. 
so it can be used for media training, and particularly for the. This is, I think, a great tool. For the larger your company or organization, if you have global offices, uh, to bring people together in a hangout uh, for training purposes, to teach them how to uh, answer questions, to get your messages aligned. It's very hard to do on a phone call, particularly in, when you're in a crisis. So it can be used long before a crisis ever happens. It can be used when the crisis hits and you need to bring everybody together to communicate internally. And then the real power of this, I believe, is uh, news conferences online. And a lot of people are already doing this. Uh, as you know, Krishna, uh, newsrooms have been cut dramatically in, in, uh, around the world because of the way the industry has changed. And uh, reporters can't get out to events like they used to, particularly news conferences. So when you can uh, hold an online news conference using a tool like this, it, it, it's powerful. Uh, you could people could ask questions in the chat box. I mean, just like you and I ha are doing here, that could be used very powerfully. And I think it's also really important uh, in the most serious kinds of crisis situations. And this is something, if you look back at all my shows, I say it all, as much as I can. And that is in the most serious crisis situations, the CEO or top executive of your organization has to be visible. And that doesn't always mean physically on the ground. But if that official that executive can't physically be there, the next best thing is getting on video just like this to make a statement, to express empathy as the case may be, to tell people what he or she is doing to improve the situation, to save lives, whatever the case may be. There's, of course, there's thousands of hypotheticals you could throw into this, but that is this is a great tool because it is up close, it is personal, and does convey the brand, if you will, the reputation, the things that you, you do in your business as well, Krishna. Terrific examples you've given there, and I'll just wrap up on this piece, piece in terms of saying that you could also use this for employee engagement as well around a crisis. Very often, if you are in a crisis, um, one of the things is you don't necessarily want your people to know about this in terms of just from the media. And I know I've actually been in situations where the first thing I got to hear about, or the first thing, uh, first way I got to hear about something going on in the organisation I was working with, is actually my husband phoning up and telling me what was being broadcast on the news that morning before I'd even got into work. And so your people are really important and keeping them aligned. You don't have to use this, of course. Um, you could actually use other online tools, but just as we're talking about Google Hangouts here, there are obviously live um, events you can do, but you can also do things privately. And I think that's really important to keep your people aligned to understand that they know what's going on, that they're prepared because they're going to also be asked by people in their networks about what's going on and, and you've got to prepare them to be able to respond and know what they can say. So um, definitely lots of applications there. Yeah, Rich, I just, I just add a quick point to that because I think you really hit on something very important for our audience and that is this, your, your employees really are your reputation ambassadors and it's, it's critical you get them on board as early as you can in the crisis so they don't hear it from the media and they don't get the call and don't, not know what to do with it. People also should know, know some of those tips as well. So. so Rich, we're going to just come to the end of the show in, in a couple of minutes. Um, I'd like to invite you to, to remind people how they can find out about the crisis show. Um, and of course you've got the show going out looking back at 2013 and I'm delighted to be one of your guests on that in the next uh, 24 hours but in fact of course people if people miss it they'll get the replay but let people know how they can best get in contact with you just before we wrap up the show sure thank you for that uh, www.youtube.com slash the crisis show is where you can watch the show tomorrow um, www.thecrisisshow.com is where our, is our main website where you can watch past shows and, and show notes uh, and also keep an eye on uh, Twitter account at the crisis show my business is www.richkleincrisis.com. So thank you for that opportunity to share that with our your viewers. Okay, so just as we're wrapping up the show now, I want to leave you with some thoughts. I think Rich has given us some terrific ideas, both in terms of how Hangouts have supported his business and really practical tips about how to bring in guests um, so actually identify guests, invite people, support them in terms of getting used to the, the platform 
and of course marketing the show as well which has resulted in, in some great business opportunities for him as well. So I really invite you to think about what are you going to do next. Last time I talked about a great place for us to start is by watching other people's hangouts and perhaps then looking at is there an opportunity for you to be um, maybe just appear in the film strip as, as somebody who's a participant not necessarily actually on stage so to speak as a, as a key speaker so I think there's some early stages that you can explore I hope today's show has given you some ideas and inspiration and please do let me know I'd love to feature um, your thoughts and feedback um, and also let me know about people that you'd like to have as guests and topics you want us to cover outside of um, Google Hangouts. We'll be doing that this for the next four or five weeks with the guests that I've got lined up. Um, and just to talk about our next guest, um, our next guest and our next show is actually going to be Monday the 13th of January 2014 and that's 8 p.m. here in Ireland and that's going to be 3 p.m. Eastern and 12 p.m. Pacific. Um, you can find all the details of how to get notifications about the show at visualcontentmarketingshow.com. Our guest is actually Stefan Hovnanian. If you are, are on Google+, Plus, I'm sure you've come across him. Um, he has produced some really interesting and supportive work around um, getting the most out of Google+. Plus. He also has a show himself, and he has a web marketing business. So we're exploring different kinds of businesses. He's in professional services as well, um, just as Rich is today, just as Sarah was last time. And I think it'll be really interesting to hear his perspective of what's working in terms of using Google Hangouts. So I really invite you to join us next time. And remember, go over to visualcontentmarketingshow.com. Um, you can get access to our previous episodes directly from there. And if you want that email notification, just uh, hit the subscribe button and put your details in. But for today, that's thank you so much for being with us. Rich, thank you so much for being a terrific guest. And I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow, Rich, and in fact, to people who are here watching the show in terms of our next episode. Thanks again, Rich, for joining us. Thank you, Krishna. I really appreciate your time.